So you all work in e-commerce and it's a Friday afternoon and you're in Brighton and it's sunny outside. I think you're a disgrace. <laughs> um, hello Brighton Centre. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> If I wasn't a fat, bald, multi-channel consultant, I'd like to be Dave Grohl. <laughs> and if I wasn't Dave Grohl, I'd like to be a unicorn. Anyway, unfortunately, I'm John, and I've got another confession for you. Feel free to spot the other Foo Fighter lyrics that I do put into this talk. I actually built my first retail website in 1998 for a company called Bowden. Um, looking at some of you in, in the first talk, I don't think some of you were actually alive when I built my first retail website. So it's lovely to see so many young people here. Um, there were no e-commerce people. I had to create my own job. I was the marketing manager for Bowden. Um, I ended up being e-commerce director for the fig leaves and all sorts of other people. Um, but it's, it's really something that never existed. So the fact that you're all here 20 years ago, which was when I was really building my first website, there were about 10 of us in the UK, and that was it. And we were all people who had warehouses and direct businesses that suddenly realised that they could put this funny front end thing on a computer and they might sell some stuff. Um, here I am 20 years later, I think I've sold several hundred million pounds worth of stuff on the website. Some of it, not that legally. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of scars on these arms as I've actually built eight different websites over the years, um, including Spoofix, I put the first click and collect real-time UK website in, and that was seven years ago, it was kind of visionary at the time, obviously the whole world does it now, if you're a builder, it's still very important that you can look at stuff on your mobile phone and just go and pick it up really easily, that was the plan, we thought it would give us about five years worth of competitive advantage over the rest of the industry, we were surprised when, 10 years later, Travis Perkins still hadn't built a website. Um, so I went and did that for about 12 months too. So I'd like to share some of the stuff I've learned over the years with you and just try and avoid giving you some of the pitfalls, some of the things that people still do that isn't so good, some of the stuff that we did that's fun that we did. And this is the first one. So, I've called it being fooled by PPC and SEO jargon. This actually fits on both sides of the equation. It's often a lot of the people who are sitting in this audience who work for retailers, who have agencies, are often misled, are worried, are frightened of looking stupid by asking questions to SEO agencies, to PPC agencies. Don't be. I've just spent the last year going into lots of different companies and finding very, very poor SEO and PPC, an awful lot of them. It's a common trend. There's an awful lot of people out there who don't know what they're doing. These guys, however, are absolutely flipping brilliant. So, the language of what we do with PPC and SEO confuses boards of directors. What we do is incredibly important. The jobs that you guys are doing are amazing. They're different. If you are a, a 50 odd year old executive, it's hard to understand what you do. It's a real education job and actually getting that into the boardroom and being able to explain how important what you do is a phenomenal asset. If people don't understand, they won't give you the money, they won't give you the backing to do the stuff that you know is important. So. I looked at some of our language, and it's stuff that I hope you're all familiar with, but we talk about SERPs, we talk about RDSA, we talk about RLSA, we talk about SEO, SEM, SEA, CPC, BNM, ECPC. We talk about robots, artificial intelligence. We talk a different language, 
we talk a different language to the rest of the company, we talk a different language even to marketing, and they're pretty special. It's important that we educate people and bring boards of directors with us. That's kind of my take out from this one. I've got one more. Never employ an SEO or a PPC agency who are a combination of a colour and a reptile. <laughs> so I'm very sorry if there's anyone here from Blue Gecko, Green Frog. Don't go there. <coughs> Traditional e-commerce excuse. We need a new website. The old one doesn't really work very well. No, you don't. All the leading big enterprise platforms are rubbish. They're all out of date. They're always behind the curve. You're always working with out of date technology. They have roadmaps with three years written on them, with stuff on them that you want now. You're much better off taking your money and spending it on the site that you've already got. You'll find it's much better value for money. If you have to start again, you're spending millions of pounds potentially, starting from scratch. As soon as you get the consultants in, and I'm, now I'm a consultant now, apologies to all the other consultants out there, they're asking you all those questions that you were asking about both sites and customers five years ago. It's not actually changed. Most of that stuff still works. If you can actually improve your existing website, you'll find it a damn sight more cost effective. I see a hell of a lot of people in that audience smiling, some of it nervously. Who's putting a new website in at the moment? One, two, three, four, five. There probably aren't enough qualified people who know how to build websites to do that, and that's just in this audience. Most of those enterprise platforms still don't have a proper mobile segment. Think about that. It's 2017. If you do have to build a new website, then your old one must be really rubbish. Make sure it is. Not knowing who your customer is. It's easy to get misled when you build a website to be suckered into all sorts of different things about customers. My favourite is prob probably attitudinal marketing. All our customers are different. They have different attitudes when they come to the website. Yeah, they do. But you can't measure what that attitude is. There's no flipping away on the website in your life. You can measure your customer's attitude as they walk in. You can tell lots of stuff, but not that. If you're a mum of two, you could be shopping for yourself. You could be shopping for that lovely dress for yourself. You could be shopping for something for your kids. You're in a different mood, but you're the same person. Please don't go down an attitudinal route. And if anyone ever tells you to, don't do it. If you're going to go down the route of customer segmentation, which you all should do, try and keep it reasonably simple. The more complex it gets, the harder it is. Three types of customer is probably enough for most businesses. Oh, one last one. No one has ever made shopping by some sort of experience work online. So if you're trying to do everything you need to do up a room, that's not how people shop. If you're ever trying to do, I'm doing my whole bathroom. That's not how people are going to shop with you. They're never even looking for a whole outfit. When they come to you, mostly they have something specific in mind. My company is unique. My brand is special. My customers are different. They're not. They're all shopping on Amazon. They're all shopping on eBay. They're all quite happy. I work with a lot of brands, they have much more in common than they have differences. Be they plastic guttering or be they women's wear. Actually, mostly what people want is to get on a website and get off again. That's why they come to us, that's why they don't want to muck around going to retail shops. 
what they do want is a brilliantly easy experience. Not something different, not something special, and not a unique web experience. I've only got five minutes left. There was one company that was special, and that was Burberry. If you could ever go on a time machine and go back five years, go and have a look at the Burberry website. It's a beautiful thing. Unshoppable, but beautiful. <laughs> but it was never designed to be shopped. Burberry just wanted their customers to see their beautiful stuff. They didn't actually care about making any money out of it. That wasn't what they were up to. So this is an SEO conference. I've done one slide on SEO and PPC. I thought I should do another one that had something relevant in terms of content. So com companies still don't have content plans. Companies still don't employ enough co copywriters. Fundamentally, there's about as much text on a website as there is in an average novel these days. So make sure you've got really good, qualified people who actually can write in the style of your customer. It's not about the product, it's actually at that point who your customer is and what they want to hear from you that's important. And once again, it doesn't matter whether you're selling a boiler or whether you're selling a £350 pair of shoes, it's the same. It's all about how does that customer want to perceive that product. And content, I think content's important to SEO apparently. Customers just come to shop. Well, actually, they don't. If you've got a really good website out there that's transactional and retail, you're probably getting a response rate of about 5%, maybe 10 if you're B2B or something like that. Of course, you want to work on it, and you want to make sure that you improve conversion and all those things. But please think about the 90-odd percent of people who don't come to buy something. The question is, what the hell are they there for? On a personal basis, I spend my life looking for instructions. This is a man, I throw them away. At the point at which I put something together and it doesn't work, I then go online and I go looking for instructions. It's in the bin, my wife's tidied it up, it's all gone. <laughs> help is what customers are often after. Please make sure your help stuff isn't just an afterthought. And some of those customers are still weirdly looking for physical shops. I know it's not something we understand. Anyway, make sure you make it easy. Hippos. Does anybody know what a hippo is? Highest paid person. Yeah, that's a that's a place. I, I always go for highly important people's opinions. I had a boss once who said that website colours look too dark on the website. I went to his monitor and I turned the brightness up. That seemed to work. <laughs> we all have a boss or have a boss who has a boss. He comes to say, I've got a really good idea for your website. One of my friends at a dinner party who's a very highly paid management consultant said, wouldn't it be a good idea if you did this? You can counteract the effect of the hippo. The way you do it is through testing and web analysis software. Prove that your customers don't want what your managing directors mates do. I understand it's a good idea, but when we actually asked our customers, this is what they thought. That tends to make the conversations pretty quick. I'm not going to cover this one too much, because for all the people who were here this morning, this got covered amazingly well, and for about 15 minutes, so I'm going to speed through this one. There's no such thing as perfection on websites. 80% is good enough, and continual improvement is what's important. Websites aren't window posters, they're fluid things and they change every day. One managing director who I work for, when talking about my website, and I was very frustrated, I was doing some affiliate stuff and it wasn't working. And I said, I'm going to make it work. And he said, John, 
It's hard to kill your babies. You get obsessed with making stuff work. But if it doesn't work, kill it. That's a piece of advice I've never forgotten, and it's one of the best pieces of advice I've ever had. So if you're going to scribble one thing down, and you're going to have a takeout, I do love a good takeout, that would be it. It's the web. Kill your babies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one other one. Never fear to fail. Failure on websites is good. You can't get everything right all the time. It's important to know what went wrong and then just not do it again. <laughs> web designers are often mental. Take a look at your web designers when you get back to your offices. You probably wouldn't let them borrow your car. You probably wouldn't invite them to your house. And they're probably not your customers. But you happily let them des design your website. Never stop them at that having ideas. But make sure that whatever you do gets tested with your customers because they're probably not them. That didn't work, did it? <laughs> what it says is if, if the same effort was put into delivering sales as forecasting them, the world would be a better place. I work with a lot of companies who don't have the resources of an Amazon or an eBay. Often in e-commerce, we're still quite tight teams. Changing the forecast won't deliver it, although finance departments still seem to be under the opinion that that's what happens. Redo the forecast. And yeah, the forecast happens. It never happens. Um, so I'm just going to finish by saying just do the best, the best, the best you can do. And that's it. Thank you.